Hello and welcome to Front Runner Motorsport. Well, we have previously looked at the best Brazilians, Finnish, Swedish and Australians to have ever raced in Formula 1. So now let's move on to the Netherlands. I thought Netherlands was a country with a proud history in motorsport, when in actual fact they only have a handful of point scorers to choose from. No wonder the Dutch motorsport fans cheer so hard for Max Verstappen, they've had nothing to cheer about for the last 100 years. Of the 16 Dutch drivers to have raced in Formula 1, Rob Slotmaker never started, Rolof Vunderink, Ben Pon, Michael Bleekermolen, Boy Hage and Dries van der Loef never even got to see a chequered flag in their brief times in Formula 1, but I have managed to find 10 who deserve to be on the list of 10 best Dutch Formula 1 drivers ever. So if you like then subscribe and with that sit back, relax and let's begin. Sport. Number 10, Hube Roffengatter. Hubertus, or Hube Roffengatter, was not your typical Formula 1 driver. Despite some mild success in European Formula 2 with a single win for docking Spitzley Racing, he had to find unique ways to get a Formula 1 drive, including taking out an advert in the newspaper, and probably nothing short of selling his own mother to get a seat in Formula 1. He got personal sponsorship to pay for a Formula 1 drive, Unfortunately, he must have been paid in breadsticks because the drives he got were rubbish. Starting mid-season in 1984 with the Spirit Racing Team in Canada, qualifying 24th before finishing 14 laps down and not being classified. He then failed to qualify in Detroit, retired in Dallas and was again not classified at Silverstone before finishing 9th in Germany and 8th in Monza. He'd have 8 races for Osella in 1985 with a best 7th in Austria and a final year with Zach Speed in 1986. He mostly retired but did get an 8th in Austria, but his career was over. Nicky Lauda once described him as a Rattengott, or God of Rats. I don't know what Hube did, maybe pissed in Nicky Lauda's breakfast cereal or something, but he did manage some decent drives outside the points that he probably wouldn't have got if he didn't advertise himself. He was also the manager for Jos Verstappen when he started his career, so now we know who to blame. Number 9, Guido van der Gaard. I honestly don't rate Guido van der Gaard very highly as a driver. He's done okay, winning the Formula Renault 3.5 Series Championship in 2008 with P1 Motorsport, before taking 5 wins in 4 years of GP2, the feeder system to Formula 1. This would score him a season in Formula 1 with Caterham, who were absolutely naff, and after a season of driving at the back several laps down of the actual race cars, doing no better than 14th in Hungary, he'd test for Sauber in 2014 and was supposed to get a race seat with the team for 2015, but ended up suing Sauber after they announced Felipe Nazza and Marcus Ericsson instead. Sauber settled out of court, but Formula 1 teams were not queuing up for Guido's signature, and he has since won the European Le Mans LMP2 series in 2016, and still races in the World Endurance Championship for Team Netherland. Number 8, Jan Flinterman. Jan Flinterman was the first Dutch driver to race in Formula 1, although he shares that honour with Dries van der Loef, but whilst Dries failed to finish the race, Jan Flinterman took an impressive ninth. Sort of. 1950s Formula 1 is weird and has weird rules, but Jan Flinterman raced for Escuderia Bandeirantes in a Maserati A6 GCM. Unfortunately, his car was retired with a rear axle problem on lap 7, and Jan Flinterman took over teammate Chico Landi's car, which he managed to take to the end of the race in 9th. Now why have I put him 8th in the list? Well, he was also a pilot in World War II, and I think that is pretty impressive. Number 7, Christian Albers. Christian Albers is technically the first Dutch driver on this list to actually score points, but he scored 4 points in the 2005 American Grand Prix, when only 6 cars raced after the rest of the field pulled out with concerns for their Michelin tyres. Finishing 5th in this race is less impressive when you remember Thiago Montero was 3rd and Narain Kazakayan is in front of you. The rest of the 2005 season with Minardi was pretty poor, no better than 11th in Canada. He moved to Midland in 2006 and after being nearly killed at Imola by Super Aguri legend Yuji Ida, a legend in the sense he is legendary for being terrible, Albers on the other hand would only manage 10th once at Hungary, before a half season at Spiker, 
in 2007 that yielded no decent results and he was replaced by Marcus Winklehock and Sakon Yamamoto. He had returned to DTM where he had success before his Formula 1 career, but after a bad season he did a few endurance races before taking up management. He worked for Caterham F1 in 2014 and was probably instrumental for Guido van der Gaard being hired. Number 6 Jan Lammers I am a Jan Lammers fan simply because he raced that wonderful Volvo estate in the British Touring Cars in 1994. His Formula 1 career is just weird though, starting with Shadow in 1979, a team quickly descending into Shadows. It was a tough year with a best ninth in Canada and it only got more difficult in 1980 when he joined ATS and struggled to qualify for races. He'd leave mid-season for Team Unipar Ensign and failed to qualify for 5 out of 6 races entered, retiring from the only race he got in the grid for at Zandvoort. That would surely be it, but 10 years later he resurfaced for a couple of races with March, finishing 12th in Australia. Outside of Formula 1, Jan Rammers won the 24 hours of Le Mans with the Silk Cut Jaguar team in 1988. He's taken part in 24 24 hours of Le Mans races, has pretty much raced everywhere in pretty much everything and he is one of my favourite drivers of all time, partly for the strangeness of his career and of course, Volvo! Number 5, Robert Dornbos. One of the true forgotten men of Formula 1, Robert Dornbos raced under both a Monaco and Netherlands race licence in his time in Formula 1 but he was born in Amsterdam so he is very much a Dutchman. After winning at Spa for Arden in the final year of International F3000 and finishing third overall, Dawn Boss secured an F1 test drive with Jordan for 2004 and 2005. Mid-season, a seat opened up at Minardi after Patrick Freisacker was sacked for sponsorship reasons, i.e. not enough money. In eight races for Minardi, Dawn Boss was consistent in finishing pretty much last, but that was where Minardi's were and he was dropped after the team was sold. He did get three more races with Red Bull at the tail end of 2006, replacing the underperforming Christian Kleon, but once again scored no points. He's taken wins in Champ Car, Super League Formula and A1GP, but has seemingly retired from active motorsport and has instead become a broadcaster on Dutch motorsport programmes, as well as starting his own sex toy company, Kiru, which seems to specialise in VR sex things. Interesting. Number 4, Giers van Lennep. Giers van Lennep is a low-ranking member of the Dutch nobility, something called a Jonk here. Sounds like one of Robert Dornbos's sex toys. He's also a two-time winner of the 24 Hours of Le Mans with Helmut Marko in 1971 and Jackie X in 1976, both in Porsches. He had a smattering of Formula 1 races over a four-year period, racing for Stitch Ting Auto Races Netherland in a Surtees car taking the car to 8th place after qualifying 21st of 24. He was meant to race for Team Surtees in America, but Sam Posey raced his car instead. Van Lennep would enter 5 races for Frank Williams in 1973 and 74, taking a point in the Dutch Grand Prix before moving to Team Ensign for 3 final races in 1975, taking another point in Germany. He would retire from racing in 1976. Number 3, Carol Godin de Beaufort. Another member of the Dutch nobility and the third most successful Dutch Formula 1 driver ever, despite scoring just 4 points. You see how disappointing Dutch drivers have been in Formula 1. It would take Nick de Vries scoring just 5 points to become the third greatest Dutch driver ever. Carol Godin de Beaufort was also known as Fatty Porsche because of his burly frame that his self-entered Porsche F1 cars had to be custom made around. Apparently Formula 1 is just like a school playground. He entered his own cars under the name of Ecurie Masbergen, starting in 1957 at the German Grand Prix as a Formula 2 entry, finishing 14th. He had finished 11th at the Dutch Grand Prix in 1958, 9th in France in a Maserati for Scuderia Ugoloni in 1959, 8th in the Dutch Grand Prix in a Cooper in 1960, before entering nearly a whole season in 1961 with a best 7th in Italy. He had entered his first full season in 1962 taking points in the Dutch and French Grand Prix, and in 1963 read the points in Belgium and America. He'd make his final appearance at the Dutch Grand Prix, retiring with engine failure on lap 8. Sadly, at the 1964 German Grand Prix, he was killed in practice after his car swerved at the Bergwerk corner. He was a humorous character, often racing without shoes, and was seen wearing a Beatles wig instead of a helmet whilst doing laps of the Nürburgring. He was only 30 when he died. A great shame. 
Number two, Jos Verstappen. Jos Verbos is the second most successful Dutch driver ever. He signed for Benetton in 1994, initially as a test driver, but when first choice JJ Leto was injured before the start of the season, Verstappen stepped in to make his debut. He caused chaos, causing a multi-car pile-up involving Eddie Irvine, Eric Bernard and Martin Brundle at the opening round before spinning out of his second race on cold tyres. JJ Leto returned at Imola, but his performances were disappointing and Jos Verstappen was brought back at the French Grand Prix and would get two podiums in Hungary and Belgium, the first Dutch driver to do so. He was replaced for the last two rounds by Johnny Herbert as the team was trying to win the Constructors' Championship, which they failed to do, but Herbert was kept on for 1995 and Verstappen was sent to Simtek. After four races his season was over because Simtek went bankrupt and Benetton dropped him. So Jos Verstappen went team hopping, signing for Footwork in 1996 scoring a single point, Tyrrell in 1997 who were just about climbing into their deathbed and Jos scored zero points for the year, a half season with Stewart in 1998 replacing the hopeless Jan Magnussen before having no drive for 1999 and signing for Arrows in 2000. He would only score three points finishes for Arrows in two years, with a fourth in Italy the best result. His Formula 1 career ended in 2003 with Minardi in a pointless season. He's won his class at Le Mans in 2008, but has been arrested for domestic assault more than he has won silverware, and he is a massive disappointment in terms of meeting his potential. Number 1 Max Verstappen his dad may have been a disappointment, but Max Verstappen is 22 and already has reached a top level in Formula 1. At just 17 and before he had a road licence, Max Verstappen was racing for Toro Rosso, regularly scoring points for the team before getting a dream drive in 2016 with Red Bull after Daniel Kvyat torpedoed his own career. And it got better. When the Mercedes duo decided to take a race off and let someone else win, Max held his head and held off Raikkonen to win on his Red Bull debut in Spain. Since then, eight more wins have followed and he has proven he is the only driver who has consistently stuck it to the Mercedes team. Although an impossible task and it has meant nine wins in total and a best third in the championship, he was currently racing in his sixth season of Formula 1 and he is still only 22. Surely he will be a champion in Formula 1 eventually. Maybe in a Red Bull, maybe not, but he has shown he is top draw talent. And he would have probably made number one on this list after his first season. Being the only Dutchman to actually win a race, he is an obvious but deserved choice for number one. And that is the list. Do you agree or do you disagree? Let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, remember to subscribe. There is plenty more motorsport content coming out. Nearly at 100 subscribers, so when we hit that number, hopefully soon, there'll be loads of special content to celebrate. Thank you for watching and have a good one.